Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight, we return to the subject of manuscripts. This particular one, Perspectiva Corporum Regularum, received little attention when it was published in 1958. However, it is publish its publisher, Wenzel Yamanitzer, the most prominent goldsmith of his era. It was extremely important in his scientific studies to improve the technical knowledge of his guilt. Darlat al-Islamiyya is pleased to welcome Dr. Heather Eka to its cultural season. Her accomplishments are difficult to summarize in a short introduction, not to mention in her CV, in a so-called modest CV. Her solid academic background in the universities of Harvard, Oxford, and London, as well as her curatorial involvement with some of the major museums in the world, is reflected in her intriguing works of scholarship within a wide range or area of Islamic art history, particularly in her focus on Islamic Spain, as well as in exhibits in which she has been curator. These include her fresh approach to the, and her detailed study of the great mosques of Cordoba in the 12th and 13th centuries, and in the exhibition Caliphs and Kings, the Art and Influence of Islamic Spain at the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. The title of her lecture, Antique Alchemies and the Prospecta of Wenzel Yamenitsu, involves a rare document. Dr. Eka is also rare, despite her constant association with so many centers of art and learning she has managed not only to be an independent scholar and curator in her own right, but also founding her own art consulting company, the Boston-based Viridian Projects. As I mentioned, Wenzel Yemenitzer was a master goldsmith. He created a number of exquisite, exquisite objects, some large, some the size of mobile phones. However, phones are not the subject of our lecture tonight. So please turn them off and let's welcome Dr. Heather Ecker. Um, so I guess this is on. Well, thank you, Dr. Bader. That was a very generous and inventive um, introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Um, thank you very much, Sheikha Hossa, for inviting me. Very kind invitation. And I'd also like to uh, thank my friend, Sue Kauchi, for her many kindnesses involved with my being here today. So, um, this evening, I'm not going to speak about a subject that emerges directly out of the artistic cultures of the Islamic world but rather about an artist who lived and worked in Western Europe in a moment when thinking people were still influenced in important ways by ideas developed in the classical Islamic world and trans transmitted by the translations of texts in centers such as Toledo, where the libraries of the Banu Dhul Nun uh, were still preserved. Many of these ideas, whether from mathematics, geometry, optics, alchemy, and natural philosophy, originated in Greek or Chinese texts that were received by well-known thinkers in Iraq, Iran, Egypt, and Al-Andalus, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, and Ibn Al-Haytham among them. These thinkers developed these ideas further through their own speculation and experimentation. So for example, for the practice of drawing in perspective, which emerged out of the practical study of optics, the translation of Ibn al-Haytham's Kitab al-Manazir to Latin in the 12th century was essential. In fact, Ibn al-Haytham was more widely known through his Latin translation than he was through the pr proliferation of Arabic manuscripts um, throughout the European medieval period, which is quite an interesting thing. In the European 16th century, 
Neoplatonist ideas developed by Muslim thinkers link the transcendence of God with the corporeal rea realities, so the physical nature of the earth. So this was a moment when it was thought that God's earth retained wonderful secrets that could be uncovered by research theory and esoteric practices. For their part, artists who experimented daily with earthly materials to achieve aesthetic effects were alchemists in their own right who understood that their creativity worked a kind of transformational magic. So, two old friends, each engaged with private studies, converse across a table. The table is set on an imaginary stepped platform in the countryside outside of the walled city of Nuremberg, whose skyline forms the backdrop. The legend in Latin reads, there is nothing better than art, nothing more wholesome in this world than art. It is a faithful companion, a courteous and good friend. The German translation below adds, and that is why artists are worth all honor. This composite image engraved by Eberhard Kieser in 1623 was intended to convey the fraternal and inventive spirit of the city of Nuremberg, renowned in the 16th century for its artists and printers, as well as its makers of scientific instruments. Johann Neudorfer on the left gestures to his companion with a variable compass, an invention of the figure on the right, Wenzel Jamnitzer, who works with a machine that produces drawings of complex objects in perspective. Between them, the caduceus, a winged staff, duly entwined with snakes, swooshes down from the heavens. The animated appearance of this arcane object suggests not only the quick wit of Hermes, messenger to the Greek gods, and by inference, the astuteness of artists, but also Hermes Trismegistus, an antique figure to whom a series of mystical texts, the Hermetica, are ascribed. The Hermetica were foundational works for the field of alchemy. The word, the word alchemy, as is well known, came from the Arabic alchimia, and was a field that was equally admired and reviled in both Islamic and European intellectual spheres. Derived from esoteric practices of classification and experimentation in antique Alexandria, it was adopted as an experimental science by Jabir ibn Hayyan in the 8th century, among others, just as it was rejected by rationalists such as Ibn Sina two centuries later. While considered vain and misguided in its attempts to turn lead into gold by some Renaissance thinkers, both its metaphysical and experimental aspects were cultivated at royal courts, notably that of the Habsburg ruler, Rudolf II, okay. who became a patron of uh, Wenzel Jamnitzer. And Jamnitzer, though an immensely practical artisan, was not immune to, the, to alchemical thinking, as we shall see. The alchemy of the natural philosophers of the 15th and 16th centuries was principally a search to understand the materiality and structure of the world, to discover the hidden secrets of nature, a noble proto-science that engaged equally with theory and practice. Like their Alexandrian predecessors, the natural philosophers re relied on the theoretical framework of classical texts, such as Plato's Timaeus and Aristotle's physics. They engaged with Plato's ideas about the symbolic transmutation and recombination of elemental materials, earth, water, air, and fire, in addition to sulfur, mercury, and salt. With Plato, they believed that both inanimate and organic matter was dynamic and living. They designed chemical experiments, including the distillation of pharmaceuticals gleaned from old herbals, and tested their e efficacy. In an era before atomist ideas gained traction, before the periodic table could be composed, and before the microscope and telescope confirmed the validity of basic physical and biological laws at any scale, alchemy was the basis of experimental scientific inquiry. It provided a framework to structure empirical knowledge. It attempted to order the range of known substances, and some of its goals, including the search for an elixir of longevity, is actually still current. Neudorfer was a calligrapher who made a living as a mathematician, and Jamnitzer a physicist who made a living as a goldsmith. 
Neudorfer published important books on calligraphy and penmanship in the German-speaking world, developing a script style that was adopted by Albrecht Dürer in his woodcuts. Jamnitzer, like other goldsmiths, contributed to the development of other fields, such as engraving and printing, and saw themselves as architects who built up pieces according to plans rather than as sculptors or jewelers. As artisans, their discourses derive from their daily experience of materials, uh, materials derived from the earth, grinding them, melting them, mixing them, oxidizing and reducing them, smelling, tasting, sensing, and forming them with their own hands. Their working practice consists of a continuous experimentation and discovery in service to both artistic results and business. Jamnitzer, in particular, was a tinkerer and an inventor a man of great curiosity and experimental energy who devised new tools to explain, uh, to expand his own creative capacities. Wenzel Jamnitzer is considered the preeminent goldsmith in Nuremberg of his generation. Born in Vienna in 1508, son of a goldsmith, Wenzel became a master goldsmith and citizen of Nuremberg at the age of 26. In 1544, he became a goldsmith juror in the guild system where he determined the guild examination for master craftsmen. He imposed the difficult task on aspiring masters to hammer up a complex pokal or tall drinking cup from silver sheet. Pokals were given as diplomatic and wedding gifts and were often commissioned by guilds that used them ceremonially. Jamnitzer designed hundreds of them in his lifetime, and his basic profile became the classic model for these vessels. In 1552, Jamnitzer was made master of the city's mint, demonstrating his esteem amongst the citizens of Nuremberg, and in particular, the goldsmiths. Here, it is important to consider that the working practices of goldsmiths included knowledge of assaying and alloying, which required the cultivation of mathematical skills um, and the recognition of the properties of metal, which put them in a unique position to oversee things like the city mint. Alongside his professional success, Jamnitzer also became politically persuasive. In 1556, he represented the Goldsmiths Guild to the Greater Nuremberg Council, and in 1573, he was elected a city alderman. His rise from Viennese outsider to executive of the inner cabinet that ruled the city of Nuremberg was due to his outstanding skills as a craftsman and his admirable character. Jamnitzer's good friend Johann Neudorfer wrote a biographical account of Nuremberg's principal artists in 1547 that contributed to the reputation of Nuremberg as an artistic city, um, as you saw in the first slide. Of his friends, the brothers Wenzel and Albrecht Jamnitzer, he wrote, these two brothers are so united in the invention of their art and in the division of their labor that neither demands from the other, neither his share nor more or less, nor do they hide from one another anything whatsoever. They both work in gold and silver, have great knowledge of perspective and proportion, and carve seals and coats of arms in silver, stone, and iron. They melt enamels in beautiful colors and have brought the art of engraving to which they use to, um, sorry, to the highest perfection. Moreover, they have molded silver animals, vermin, weeds, and snails, which they use to decorate silver vases. This was quite unheard of until then, such as a snail, all in silver, that they have molded with all kinds of flowers and herbs, which they have honored me with as a gift. The flowers and herbs that are, are so subtle and so fine that a breath of air puts them into motion. But despite all of these talents, they ascribe glory only to God. Albrecht Jamnitzer died in 1556, and very little is known about him other than Neudorfer's report that he was Wenzel's close artistic collaborator. Thus, whatever portion of the work we know, we tend to ascribe to Wenzel. The busy workshop that they established together was distinguished by a series of royal commissions serving four successes, successive Habsburg emperors, Charles V, Ferdinand I, Maximilian II, and Rudolf II, as well as uh, Ferdinand II, Archduke of Austria, other German rulers, the French court, the Duke of Ferrara, and Nuremberg patricians. <clears throat> Nicolas Neufchatel's incredibly elegant portrait of Wenzel from 1562 or 63 represents a self-selected exhibition of the artist's most important technical achievements at mid-career. 
Um, behind him, in a small niche, um, is a gold vase, perhaps hammered in repoussé, filled with silver ferns and flowers that he has cast from life, like those praised by Neudorfer. Other details of the painting are clarified by a two-volume unpublished manuscript at the Victoria and Albert Museum, dating to 1585, that was intended as a manual to accompany a desk of instruments, um, probably to present to the Duke of Saxony. In the manual, Jamnitzer describes the manufacture and use of the variable compass, which, which was adjusted by means of a hand-tightened screw, as shown um, in the diagram. In the foreground of the portrait, Jamnitzer has chosen to show not only how he cast sculptures from drawing plans, but how he scaled them to different materials at the same weight. In his hand, Jamnitzer holds an instrument of his own invention, which is marked with seven different scales according to the relative densities of gold, mercury, lead, silver, copper, iron, and tin. With this instrument, he could calculate exactly the amount of metal needed to cast the same statue proportionally at the same weight, but in a different material, which is a rather practical tool. The art of casting from life is ancient. One of the earliest uses of the technique were death masks made by the Romans as wax vestiges of departed family members and to create accurate posthumous portraits in plaster and marble. In fact, life casting is almost always a misnomer as the model, whether human, animal, or plant, is often uh, recently dead. The practice was taken up by sculptors in Florence in the 15th century who used it to create ornamental floral borders, uh, such as Ghiberti's, um, which you can see in the image cast in bronze around the eastern doors of the so-called Gate of Paradise from the Florentine uh, Baptistery. And just to show you a detail of some of Ghiberti's work actually from the other door, from the southern door, oh sorry, the north door, um, you can see the newt and the plants and Probably he used a mixture of modeling and casting from life, um, as well as an example of uh, this sort of crab and toad or other kinds of creatures like snakes that were commonly cast in Padua. Life casting and the tendency towards the imitation, imitation of nature in the art of Western Europe in the Renaissance and post-Renaissance periods was driven partly by scholastic views of natural philosophy of the era, which saw all nature as teeming with dynamic life. For practitioners like Albrecht Dürer, whose work was prized in his lifetime for its exacting and meticulous observation of nature, art could not hope to equal the, nat the nature of God's creation, but it became a measure of the validity of a work. Copying represented a practice of research of knowing nature in all of its regularity and anomalies. For Dürer, the learned practice of many years of careful observation and recording of nature became a treasury from which he could draw to create something new and imaginary. He wrote, life in nature manifests the truth of these things, therefore observe it diligently, go by it and do not depart from nature arbitrarily, imagining to find something better by yourself, for you would be misled. For indeed, art is embedded in nature. He can, who can extract it has it. The idea that art is embedded in nature lay behind the rise of cabinets of curiosity or wonder chambers amongst 15th and 16th century nobles and rulers. Those collections of rare natural exemplars, nautilus shells with metal settings, composite antiquarian objects, virtuosic gestures of artistic technique and scientific tools. These assemblages may have been born of a demonstration of humanistic capability, mercantile reach, and technological marvel, but they were also closely related to the study and classification of species. Maximilian II, father of Rudolf II, for example, acquired the most complete copy of Dioscorides herbal, surviving from antiquity, now called the Vienna Dioscorides, making the Viennese court a center for the study of botany. As Pamela Smith has argued, replicas from nature also held an important place in collections because they would remain and not putrefy, but also because of a fascination with vermin, or so-called vermin, lizards, snakes, frogs, turtles, and insects, 
which were thought to spontaneously generate out of decaying matter and came to symbolize cycles of decay and regeneration of the human soul. Detailed life casts, in a real sense, provided permanent evidence of the processes of nature and what may have inspired revulsion in the flesh inspired fascination as a replica. These objects that embodied a transmutation from living creature to quickened metals flowing into molds made by artists was nothing if not alchemical. Smith quotes the printer Walter Hermann Reif, who wrote in 1547, this part of sculpture, casting, has its origin in the true natural alchemy, not the deceptive art of seeking the philosopher's stone, which these days is called alchemy. Yamnitzer experimented with techniques for casting small animals from life, perfecting them, and even replicating the most delicate grasses, as we have seen. While others may have used alloys of tin and lead for replication because of their low melting point, Yamnitzer specialized in replicating nature in silver, um, which is evident in various projects. Um, so you see the silver lizards at the top from the Rijksmuseum, and then this, um, this box from the Kunsthistorische Museum, which is covered with uh, creatures actually cast in two-part molds, um, which you can see there. Rudolf II displayed many examples of small cast animals in his Wunderkammer, his Wunderkammer in Prague, including several silver vessels made by Jamnitzer that were adorned with life casts. It is said that he had two golden cabinets made by, quote, old Jamnitzer, filled with cast animals to which he himself kept the keys. Pamela Smith has emphasized that these objects were normally made in the round as they were meant to be passed around, they were meant to be handled and not just put into cases for display. While the technique for making such objects was not a secret, it required stunning, killing the animal, setting it on um, some clay, uh, positioning it with threads, adding vents in wax and channels for, uh, to pour the mold, um, investing it, heating the mold, burning out the organic matter, and then uh, pouring in the molten metal. Um, so the, the techniques weren't secret, but it was the perfection of Yamnitzer's examples that were admired, copied, and sometimes outright nicked, as in the case of Peter Custer, who was accused of stealing natural models from Yamnitzer's studio. His basin and ewer in the treasury of the Cathedral of the Assumption of the Virgin in Dubrovnik was made in response to Yamnitzer's example now in the Louvre. And so um, you can see the evident imitation and, uh, and a better detail of Yamnitzer's um, example. Perhaps the single most impressive surviving object that Yamnitzer made and adorned with castings from life is the so-called Merkel Table Center, now in the Rijksmuseum. The Nuremberg City Council bought this stunning object from Yamnitzer for the high price of 1,230 gulden, possibly to present to the Emperor Maximilian II, although it remained with the City Council into the early 19th century and was owned interestingly at various times by a Rothschild and by Hitler without any connection. An ode to nature and to the primordial processes of life, the decorative program of the table center both frames and is supported by a figure of Mother Earth. She rises out of a grassy knoll and upon her head rests a vessel surmounted at the apex with an enameled vase and bouquet of replicated cut flowers. The vessel, embraced by writhing young snakes and other creatures, was intended to hold fruit, creating a contrast between fresh fruits just picked and specimens permanently, permanently frozen in silver. The piece bears an inscription that reads, I am the earth, mother of all things, laden with the precious burden of the fruits that are produced from myself. Thus the earth, comprising all inorganic and organic life, is embedded in a parable of continuous generation and decay. And the table center, I have some details, is, a, is adorned with an abundance of both um, plant and animals um, replicated from life. So you can see at the base, um, the plants and some details, uh, crayfish and a cricket and uh, the central figure the bowl at the top, and the, the detail of the writhing snakes, um, and the enameled uh, vase. 
all of these young creatures would have to have, to have been trapped. All of the uh, wildflowers would have to have been gathered. So one can imagine Yamnitzer's apprentices out in the countryside with their sort of nets and snares. To make this object required not only a philosophical engagement with nature, but also a visceral one. As an adornment for the banquet table of the Habsburg ruler, the piece would have celebrated the primordial sustenance of nature for the nourishment of the royal body, and perhaps, too, a measure of the infinite extent of the Habsburg right to rule. But it also pays tribute in another way. Like Mother Earth, who produces fruits from her own body to sustain life, the artist has created a continuous impression of abundance by freezing nature in precious metals extracted and purified from the Earth's own energetic core. That these metals could just as easily be melted down again and reformed into another object, thus giving and taking life, makes the table center a visual exemplum of a continuous cycle of creative invention overseen and patronized by a benevolent ruler. A great number of Yamnitzer's plans for objects have survived, even engravings, presumably so that they could be reproduced and presented to many patrons. It is by comparing these rather flat elevations that emerged out of Yamnitzer's commercial work, drawings of actual objects that he would have made and sold, with those that emerged from his private work, describing an almost, imp uh, an almost impossible variety of objects drawn with difficulty and perspective that the enigma of Yamnitzer as an artist and as a thinker emerges. These figures, designed by Yamnitzer and engraved by the Swiss engraver Jost Amann for Yamnitzer's Perspectiva Corporum Regularium, the regular solids in perspective, published in 1568, are examples of objects that existed outside of nature. They are both based on the icosahedron, a three-dimensional polyhedral figure comprising 20 faces of equilateral triangles and associated since antiquity with the element of water. There is no evidence that Yamnitzer ever made such objects in reality, and indeed, mathematically and physically, they are impossible to fabricate by normal means. The figure on the left has such fine articulations at the points of contact that if not perfectly balanced, it would collapse. The figure on the right is a composite made of two icosahedrons, one with the faces extended into points so as to form stars. Sorry. The other icosahedron is transparent, a network of triangular faces. The two elements coincide, but do not touch, and thus represent another unstable form. Perhaps Yamnitzer is suggesting something of the quality of water, and indeed this form, just for a moment, could be perfectly balanced if floating. The unlikely physical realization of this paradoxical form is accentuated by the impossibly stacked bricks that support it from underneath. The Perspectiva is an elegant book of forms based upon the language of the Platonic solids as laid out in Plato's Timaeus, where each solid shape represents an atomic or particle constituent of matter. Each of the idealized forms is associated with what were believed to be the basic qualities of nature, organized according to their increasing mass. The tetrahedron was associated with fire or energy because it is light, pointed, and sharp. The cube was likened to earth because it is stable, heavy, and hard to move. The icosahedron was identified with water because it is more like a sphere and easy to roll the way water moves. The dodecahedron was added to the basic forms later um, because it was thought that its 12 faces corresponded to the 12 signs of the zodiac, thus the association with the heavens. Oops. Jamnitzer was by no means the first artist to attempt to draw polyhedral forms in perspective, nor was he the first to develop variants. Leonardo drew some of the regular variations for Luca Pacioli at the end of the 15th century, as we'll see in a moment. And there were other geometricians and printmakers in Jamnitzer's German milieu who were also engaged with these ideas, including Dürer, to whom I will return in a moment. However, Jamnitzer was the first to create what might be considered a vocabulary of forms 
based upon the platonic solids that responded to both geometric rules and his own aesthetic sensibilities. There is an originality in this work and an elegance of execution which is unmatched by even those who came after Yamnitzer. Each platonic shape was presented as itself with 23 solid variations and four transparent monumental forms mounted on bases. Each of these primary series was marked by a vowel, A, E, I, O, and U, written with the uncial V. While some have argued that these vowels represent a kind of basic grammar of shapes, the Emperor Maximilian II, to whom the work is dedicated, used A, E, I, O, U as an acronym to underscore the legitimacy of uh, Habsburg dynastic rule. So either in Latin, Austria est imperare orbi universo, it is Austria's destiny to rule the whole world. Or in German, alles Erdreich ist Österreich untertan, all the world is subject to Austria. The transparent monuments are followed in the perspective by a series of 12 solid and transparent spherical and eight conical forms that seem to respond to and perfect the earlier work of Leonardo for Pacioli. So those are actually the watercolors um, that were used to prepare the printed text. And Durer, um, who included these helical drawings in his Manual of Measurement from 1525. Um, but uh, it's Janitzer who really takes them to their next step, their next logical conclusion. The work ends with three conceptual monuments that seem to be perme permeated with esoteric ideas, while at the same time paying tribute to early Florentine perspectivists and their experiments, such as Paolo Uccello and Piero uh, della Francesca. The Mazzocchio, a round wicker form used as the basis for the headdress of Florentine merchants, became a, a kind of signature standing in for Renaissance preoccupations with aesthetics and tools of measurement and drawing. In Yamnitzer's engravings, the Mazzocchio stands in for a portrait or symbolic being uh, in a visual complex otherwise devoid of people. So whether casually leaning on a fence um, or forming part of a funerary monument complete with obelisks at the corners and a geometrical flower that bursts from the center, or indeed as a substitute Christ figure in a trinity of stars or a recapitulation recapitulation of Calvary, the Matsokyo seems to be infused with gesture and life. These images are strangely world wordless, but it is clear that this volume was intended as more than just a catalog of uh, exemplars. In his variations to the platonic solids, Yannitzer is describing visually the unseen world of particles, the elemental atoms of fire, air, water, and earth, and quintessence that were believed to recombine to form all life. The seriousness that Yamnitzer attached to this work, which he claimed in the prologue to have spent 40 years studying privately, is made evident by the framing of the work in a scholarly vein on the cover. The classically dressed figures emulate the traditional quadrivium of higher study, substituting architecture for astronomy and perspective for music. Uh, okay. in, his, um, in his dedication of the text, Yamnitzer wrote, I assiduously practiced and indeed have trained myself for the pleasures and consolation of my soul in a very delicate and charming art called optics by the learned and commonly perspective. And one assumes the learned here means Ibn al-Haytham. And with it, I occupied my leisure time practicing it over 40 years in that it is particularly advantageous and suitable with my profession at the same time as other honest arts. And inasmuch as I had been driven in the above mentioned art along paths both painful and long, which often tired and discouraged me, I nonetheless was carried along and maintained by the great desire, enthusiasm and inclination towards this art until the end. And now in my great age, I was brought by the grace and blessing of the Lord to the invention of a fruitful, ensured, and easy path, gaining complete satisfaction and the recompense of my many past difficulties. And in good conscience, 
I cannot help but to make a current a little summary of my industry and the application that I've dedicated to it and bring them to light. So while it is relatively easy um, to see how Jamnitz are constructed the simpler shapes by addition and subtraction, for example, here um, and here, it's really much more complicated to imagine how he planned and drew um, such complicated shapes as you see in the more developed uh, solid figures. So in fact, despite his assurance that his me method was pleasant and easy, he offers no explanation as to how they were constructed, as it was his wish to save such didactic issues for a second volume that never appeared. Only one preparatory engraving for that volume um, was ever produced, leading to questions that have not until this day been answered completely. So in this sense, um, to understand what he did, one has to turn to the perspectivists before Yamnitzer. Piero della Francesca, the great mathematician painter, absorbed much of what he put in practice from the translation of Ibn al-Haytham's work on optics. His constructions are based on geometrical descriptions of what the eye sees and were absorbed into many other 15th century works, such as Luca Pacioli that we have already seen. By the 16th century, such methods may have seemed like old hat in Italy, but in Germany, they still retained a kind of wonder. And interestingly enough, uh, for the construction of complex polyhedra, Jamnitzer rejects this method. So the mathematical construction of objects um, is off. This is what he says. Um, sorry. Okay. In the same way, one can use this art to paint towns, castles, and landscapes, and anything else, so that each object visible from afar and represented on each printed plate according to its own geometry, regardless of its remoteness and elevation in relation to another, is depicted with such accuracy that it seems impossible that is not the work of human hands. This praise from my own perspective, dear reader, I do not speak it to denigrate or diminish the labor and industry of others, but in good faith. Like the old and experienced cavalier, who kindly indicates a straight and flat road to avoid the old tortuous path, I offer to all a demonstration of the art of perspective so succinctly and pleasantly that all detours will be avoided and no line and no point will be plotted in vain, as was the case in the old tradition of teaching. Countless are those who have followed that false path where everyone struggled, sometimes having to draw 10 lines before finding one that was necessary. Here, not much is needed, and I speak from experience. I have taken much trouble. I have spared no expense, no industry, nor work until I found this approach. Thanks to God, which is enough. Now it is trouble-free work because there is no more retracing of erased lines, and he who interrupts his work will return to it just as he left it, and he will pursue it without having to engage in unpleasant research. So I think what's interesting also about that is there's more than a hint here of some of the um, esoteric background um, that may have been in, in Jamnitzer's life, the idea of the transmission of an esoteric art, the idea of the straight path, which comes really straight out of Islamic concept, uh, concepts. Um, and I don't know how he got to them, but presumably through some of the esoteric uh, schools circulating around the court of Rudolf II. So Yamnitzer rejects the mathematical approach, and what is his approach? So he invents a perspective machine, um, which you see here in this engraving. And this must be the only surviving engraving of the second volume um, that was never produced. So I just thought I should walk you through, in order to understand what's different about his machine, um, all of the perspectival machines that existed before this very quickly. Um, so the whole idea um, of finding a practical method to draw in perspective is that basically you intersect what you see in your plane of vision with a two-dimensional plane. 
Um, so it's a practical method that avoids having to construct things mathematically. And the earliest drawing of such a device is Leonardo's drawing, um, which you see there where he is, I think, using actually two screens, one on a little stand and then the one in front of him uh, to draw an armillary uh, sphere and then Durer's uh, copy of Leonardo's device. And this is, um, this is Durer's next evolution. So he takes that sort of shorter device, raises it up, and he shows an artist uh, drawing a portrait onto glass. And presumably, once the portrait is on the glass, it is then removed, traced, and then turned into a painting. So this is uh, another variation on this theme proposed by Alberti. Alberti never did a drawing. He simply described it. So this is a later um, sort of visual description of what Alberti's idea was. So instead of just having a plain uh, screen, the screen is divided into, um, into a graph. And basically, all you do is you look at the graph, you look at a particular square, and then you draw that square. And presumably, the sum total of your drawing will be in perspective. Um, and this is Durer showing how to draw a, a rather foreshortened figure um, with such a, um, a, a transparent uh, screen, which is basically made by creating a grid of threads. Um, and what's interesting is this principle is exactly the same principle as the beginning of photography. Um, so you see the ground uh, glass screen of early cameras. Um, the only difference is you, you pull that out and you put in a piece of film so that the image is recorded on the piece of film. But it's exactly that same technology. And in a sense, I think once ph photography was invented, the whole interest in actual perspectival drawing um, diminished in the history of art, which is sort of curious. Um, so this is the other method that Durer devised. This uses a string to act as the visual ray. So it acts as your eye and what your eye sees. And it's a little bit difficult to understand this drawing. Um, but what's happening is there's a frame um, at, at, uh, in the place where the guy is crouching behind. And the other man is holding a stylus. And he pulls it from the point of perspective onto a point um, on the lute. And there are two threads in the frame. And those are crossed to mark the point at which that uh, ray intersects. And then on a hinge is a piece of paper or a board. And the point is marked on the board, which is then pulled away to do the next point. So it's a way to understand perspective and foreshortening. But the whole drawing is constructed out of small dots. Um, and this is another variation where a sighting device, almost like the one on an astrolabe, is used um, to sight the object. So what's interesting, the difference between them is in all of Dürer's drawings, he is responding to an object in front of him. So there's always a thing that he can see that he is drawing. Jan Mincer's device, um, which has variable poles that you can raise and lower to create this visual ray, is devised to draw objects that don't exist. Um, and so in fact, if Dürer is working um, in a way that is easily transported into the world of photography, Jamnitzer is working in a way that's easily transported to the world of computers. So he's working in a three-dimensional way. So um, I could go back to the larger one. Um, so he's setting up the machine here, and he never explains how he uses it. But basically, he has a ground plan. So in order to create his figures, you need both an elevation and a ground plan. And both of them have to first be drawn in perspective. And then they're joined to create an object of startling three-dimensionality. Um, and so you can see he has part of what he needs there, the elevation and the ground plan, if that makes sense. Um, so it's really not, um, so Janusser had many imitators and many followers. But it's not really until the work of Nisseron that some inkling of Jamnitzer's system was uh, made clear. Um, and you see that you have the ground plan, which is drawn in a perspective uh, straight backwards. 
but the side view, the elevation is drawn at a 45 degree angle. And it's really by matching those up that you achieve this figure of startling three dimensionality, um, which is not to say that it's not difficult because Nisseron's drawings don't compare in any way to the dynamism of Yamnitzer's, I don't think. Um, so that's sort of the idea where the object um, is reduced to its constituent ground plan. So it's almost like a sort of, um, I don't know how to say it, it's almost like a foreshortened view looking down from the top, if that makes sense. And this is um, from some work that we're doing for an exhibition, trying to explore these issues um, that Jamnitzer proposes in the Perspectiva by reverse engineering um, the figures. So determining what the point of perspective is. And what becomes obvious is that he adjusted the point of perspective for each of the bodies. So the point of perspective for the lower parts of the stand and as you move up, change. Um, but he also adjusted them to, um, to have a slightly more dynamic appearance. So for example, the point of the star actually is slightly depressed into the um, stand that supports it perspectively, I think to, to give it a slightly more dynamic um, outlook. So for Renaissance and post-Renaissance thinkers, classical sources that remain standard descriptors of the natural world were widely available as printed texts. It was not until Galileo's publication of the Sidereus Nuncius, the Starry Messenger in 1610, the first astronomical treatise based upon direct observation of the sky through a telescope, that allegiance to Aristotle began to seem like a kind of intellectual slavery, lacking the nobility of a free intellect. Galileo's observations of the imperfections of the surface of the moon, formerly thought to be a smooth and perfect sphere, and the presence of thousands of unknown stars upended the received description of Ptolemy, which had been he uh, heretofore accepted in both Latin and Arabic literate worlds. Yamnitzer was a figure in many ways of his times, but also an innovator. His understanding of the structure of the world was certainly ordered by the classical sources he read, Neoplatonist ideas, and whatever other esoteric uh, schools circulated around the court of Rudolf II. His own restless creativity brought him into the forefront of an art that drew upon classical sources, Euclid, for example, and also Ibn al-Haytham, but also to create an image of an object which did not exist in the visible natural world. For modern minds, his work remains a source of fascination, not only because of its still enigmatic means of production. While easily achieved today with a computer, it captivates with its almost invisible but expressive imperfections. Thank you very much.